Okay, well, welcome everybody to um, to this joint webinar um, in partnership um, with with Amberjack kind of cells here at the at the ISC. And um, what we're going to be talking about is um, a very important subject, and it's something that actually ourselves and Amberjack have both worked together on. And today you'll be hearing from Sophie, who we've just been chatting to, but also Tristram, Chief Research Officer at the ISC. Now they'll introduce themselves as they as they um, as they sort of start on on on, on their bits that we're talking about. Um, I've already mentioned the the chat function, so please chat away in the chat function sharing thoughts and ideas but also pop your questions in there um, we've got time at the end for for questions and i'll keep an eye on that and then towards the end of the end of this webinar then um, um so interest will pull me back in and um and we'll we'll cover off any questions or thoughts that you that you have um this is a subject that we haven't covered for a very long time and i do think it's um it, it is quite an important one um and it's something that actually has always been there in the background ever since you know we started to do testing online as an industry which we've been doing for a good number of, of of years now sort of you know sort of um 15 possibly even 20 years now in one one shape or another and um and it just reminded me actually my, my wife once had an email um from a, from a candidate saying i've got a bit of a stinking hangover can you do this numerical reasoning test for me um it was a student who'd hit um, reply instead of forward so um, and, and uh, part of that being a funny story but I think it shows that actually I think sometimes we bury our heads in the sand a little bit about this we've known that there's a possibility of this happening but we're not quite sure how to how extensive it is and actually once you start lifting rocks like this you never quite know where it ends up so I think it's really important that we have um, have this have this conversation so um, please engage and the other thing to say is we are recording this um, and we will send a recording to everybody that, that registered this so um, um, please feel free to follow up on it it, recap on things that you missed but also share it amongst your teams and start a conversation on this within your organizations um so that's enough for me um i'll come back in towards the end um tristram over to you very good okay so it's i i, I was really interested in uh this poll that we did so we've been doing polls as people will probably have spotted if you're an isc member we've been doing polls every month uh pretty much for all isc members and really to try and take the temperature of how people are feeling about various things and also to kind of maybe address sort of interesting issues that perhaps wouldn't get covered in one of our big um, surveys. So perhaps like the recruitment survey, which we're running at the moment. So if you're an employer, fill it in. But uh, but this is uh, so we're going to be reporting the the August polling here. Um, and if you want more information about it, then it's on the website. If you go to our um, our uh, uh, the the papers section the reports section that's on the knowledge hub then you'll be able to download the this this month's polling and and lots of you know previous months pollings as well um so i suppose i was a little bit skeptical when, when amberjack came to me that whether this was going to really be a big issue um we you know interested in are our, our students honest um you know our employers worried about it is that is there anything you can do about it and and you know i it was something I didn't hadn't really given an awful lot of thought to, but I was kind of a little bit concerned. So, um, and as often is the case, I was I was proven completely wrong. And so we'll present you the the data to just give you a sense of what what it is. So we had two hundred and seventy two responses. We've broken down who they're from, but basically about half of them are from employers, and the rest are from our university and supplier members. So if we go on to the next one. Uh, so the first question we really asked was, does honesty matter? You know, does it does it really matter if students are honest? And so what I've done here is just show the agree and strongly agree responses that we got to this. And so the first question is, do students uh, need to demonstrate honesty and integrity during during recruitment process? And absolutely, really strongly, everybody was in agreement of that so we've got what was almost 90 percent of respondents said yes yes of course they do you know we, we can't be running recruitment processes if students aren't being honest and you know behaving with integrity are students who cheat during recruitment are they dodgy you know can you trust them so if somebody gets through is it just a kind of well uh you know you know they're a bit they're a bit clever they've outfoxed our process so fair enough and they'll probably be a great employee actually you know most of our respondents say no if if you're cheating in recruitment you can't be trusted in general it's a concerning trait so it's not just that you're not playing the game it's actually it tells us something we believe it tells us something about 
wider behavior from students. And similarly, most of our, most of our participants agreed that generally dishonest individuals are less effective workers. So, you know, that's why it matters so much. I mean, it matters for other reasons as well. But one of the reasons is that, that being able to kind of identify dishonest students and remove them is a way of removing people who will cause you problems in the longer run. So that's, so that, you know, very strong agreement on that. One of the, uh, one of the areas where there was less strong agreement, which I think is really interesting, is that in general, people didn't agree that dishonest individuals progress more slowly in their career. Sorry, we've got a few people coming through on there who need to, to Sorry, I think overzealously somebody just muted. Okay, let me out. Okay, right. So I think that's really interesting because what it tells us is that while we while we agree that that honesty and integrity is important and that uh, the candidates who don't demonstrate it in recruitment are create as problems and are not as effective as workers we also are, are, are aware or at least suspicious that there are some people who are who are progressing through their career um more you know more quickly through dishonesty so you know it's it's i think that's you know an interesting thought but in general people have kind of have got a big problem with the dishonesty so if we go on to the next slide and um, so is it really happening so we asked, have you seen or suspected cheating? And the, the majority, 64%, said, yes, we have seen or suspected cheating. And then we say, well, what kind of things have you seen or suspected? Well, the most, the most common that we've got here <laughs> are the sharing of want you to, so, yeah, questions that's, that's and assessments so, yeah, and to stress safe. Um, I was struggling with the start, uh, muting you, again. Should you get the role? When you start, you could get a bit of a feel of the, what the office is like. Great. Um, so sharing of interview questions, assessment centre tasks. I suppose Pete, some students, and we'll get to this, Amber Jack will get to this in a second. Some students might not feel that's really cheating, just helping each other out, sharing stuff around. It definitely shades more into kind of definite cheating where people are sharing kind of model answers or good answers around. Uh, and, and I think people couldn't really pretend that they didn't think it was cheating if you've got someone other than you taking the test. Uh, but we see also collaborations, so, you know, groups of students potentially sitting around helping each other as they, they collectively take the test. Uh, faking uh, or exaggerating experience and qualifications, that actually was something we didn't raise, but in the other, it came up a lot of times. So, we, you know, if we did this survey again, we might find that came up a bit more. And so... The cheating was not so much just in the assessment process, but overall in a kind of misrepresentation of your of your experience. But the problem is that as we moved everything online, more and more people are agreeing that it's uh, difficult to detect cheating now. Recruitment's online, and there's a, a pretty you know ch big chunk of people who say like you know I just don't know really. I'm not sure. I certainly can't be sure that there hasn't been cheating, but I don't know whether there has. And so then you've got about a quarter of our respondents who say they've never seen any cheating or dishonesty. So these are all people who are involved in the, in the recruitment process or in supporting students through the recruitment process in some, in some way. So, you know, I think the overall picture here is one where actually cheating is quite a big issue. And some of the things that some of the particularly the sort of softer forms of cheating of essentially sharing around information are are things which are kind of quite common issues. So if we go on to the next slide. So what are you doing about it? Um, so overall, we are we asked uh, everybody, you know, are you actually taking any action to reduce cheating? And overall, our respondents say, uh, yeah, a minority, but a pretty big minority are actually doing something actively about this. And when you look at employers, that, that's much more strongly employers who are, who are doing that. So 54% of employers, whereas only 32% of universities. And that did make me think, is there a bit of a a need for a greater shared responsibility on this. I mean, you know, if, if students are cheating, you know, should that be something that universities are sort of actively 
addressing, talking about, trying to do something about, um, as well as just leaving it to employers. You know, it's not saying no university respondents were doing anything. So what, what are people doing? Well, so we've got here the kind of already introduced or considering introducing just to give us a sense of what people are thinking about. So people are designing assessment tasks to make cheating more difficult. You know, it's one of the strongest ones. So, you know, if you, if you don't have a model answer, if you don't ask everyone the same questions, then obviously it's uh, more difficult for students to cheat, especially in some of those ways that they were co you know, commonly cheating. Discussing the issue with students and candidates is, is another important strategy. Just talking about it, saying this is not acceptable, setting out the rules, being clear. And then you've got some of the more sort of technical approaches that people are using, things like identity verification. So, you know, making sure that the person who's taking the test is the person. Triangulating with other parts of the recruitment process. So if somebody does brilliantly well in a test, that shows that they're a you know, fantastic extrovert and yet they can't speak a word when you see them at an assessment centre, maybe something dodgy is going on. So that sort of triangulation approach. And then forms of automated verification, which I think Amberjack are going to pick up a bit more later on. But you know, there's all sorts of techniques and technologies that people are using to try and do that. And then encouraging reporting. So, you know, if you see your friend doing it, tell us. Or if you're maybe, you know, we should say if careers advisors in universities or schools see this, maybe they should be encouraging reporting as well. And then, you know, a range of other sorts of responses. So, so there's quite a lot of strategies that are being used. But overall, most of our respondents are not, not doing anything really, or, or at least a very large proportion of, of respondents are not doing anything about this. And I think some of it, is because they're lacking ideas about what exactly to do. So if we go on, I will now, I think, hand over to Sophie to talk a bit about some of the work that Amber Jack have been doing, and, uh, and we'll then hopefully have a bit of a chance for questions at the end. Thanks, Tristram. And, and it's really interesting, because actually, we probably arrived at this issue in it, from a similar direction to yourself, Tristram, you're just describing that you weren't you know, a little bit surprised at um, us raising it and, and Stephen you were saying for ages you know, as an industry you probably suspected there's something here but you know have been a bit concerned to, to lift the rock and I, I'd say we were probably in a similar place you know we thought there was probably something going on in certain respects but that didn't necessarily think it was a major problem until one of our clients came to us and well it said over a number of months we really want you to focus more on this area help us more in this area and they suspected that as many as 20% of their students at their final assessment centre stage were cheating. We thought, wow, gosh, I mean, that, that if it's 20%, if one fifth of the people you're assessing, you're not entirely sure that you can trust, that, that is quite a big deal. Um, and, and we started to focus on it a little more. Um, and I'm going to take you through some of our, our sort of thinking on the topic and some of the insights and some ideas on potentially what you might be able to do if you think that maybe there is um, a reason to be concerned about the, the validity or the, the trust you can deploy in relation to students to take participating in your process. So, you know, this, this question was asked as part of the survey, but I guess I um, wanted to share my thoughts on it. I think there are, there are two reasons why applicants cheating through a recruitment process matters. One, one is the, the obvious one around integrity. If you look at most organisations, um, values, you'll see integrity in one form or another being um, you know, highlighted as critically important part of the, the sort of culture within the organisation. And for, for a lot of businesses, particularly those with, you know, an element of involvement in the financial services sector, there are some very serious reasons why you need to be able to trust your workforce and make sure that there's no risk that those individuals are likely to be tempted into any ill-advised or fraudulent behaviour. Um, so there's a, an issue that if somebody cheats through an assessment process um, or if they're sort of dishonest through that process, the chances are they may make misjudgments in other processes as well. They may not think that cheating's all that bad, it's just getting a job, but actually there might be other situations in which for the organisation it's absolutely critical that they obey the rules and they do things appropriately or follow a process. And if they haven't displayed that behaviour as part of your recruitment process, you can't be confident that they will display that behaviour in other high stakes situations when they're an employee of your organisation. And the other side of things is that you may very well be hiring people into your roles who don't have the skills and abilities that are required for success. 
Um, I think you know, there's quite a lot of documentation on the cost of mishiring. And if you have got people who are cheating your recruitment process, clearly the chances are higher that the, if you do make them an offer, they may not have the skills and abilities that you require in the role. Um, and equally, that if they aren't able to get through the job, um, the you know, recruitment process on their own merits, that potentially they're not going to be engaged and happy in the role. So you, you do then obviously have an increased uh, attrition and underperformance risk as a consequence if people are cheating through your process. So, you know, I, I think it's it's fair to say that, you know, if you do have reason to believe that somebody is actively being dishonest through your recruitment process, it, it is something that organisations should pay some attention to. But we, we spent a little bit of time thinking about the different types of cheating or the different types of cheats that you may be experiencing through your recruitment process. And Patricia alluded to this earlier. Our, our number one is sort of the, the not what we're terming naive sharers. So, you know, for generations Y and Z, and actually for, for most of us in this digital era, sharing's caring. Um, you know, this population are very used to publishing all elements of their lives on social media, you know, whether it's their, their breakfast or whether it is the questions that they were asked to respond to um, through, through an interview. They're used to contributing user-generated content. And you know, often I think we see members of these generations sharing materials online without any kind of malicious intent. They ju they're just trying to help others without really thinking it through. That the reason why we said naive sharers is you know, because it is very naive behavior. They're not really thinking through understanding the potential implications of their actions, but there's certainly no malice behind it. Um, they're not deliberately trying to undermine your organization. Um, and they're not you know, deliberately trying to help you hire people who aren't well suited to your role. They're just not thinking it through and they're just you know, replicating the sorts of behaviours that they demonstrate in other aspects of their lives in relation to um, you know, this experience, which is you know, a big significant factor in their lives um, and therefore something that they want to, to talk about and share with others. There's then uh, what we would sort of term casual cheats, who are the sort of counterpart to naive sharers. So these are applicants who aren't very serious about cheating. They're not actively thinking about how they can undermine your recruitment process, but they are tapping easily, tapping into any easily accessible information as part of your, your preparing for your recruitment process. You know, they won't go to any significant lengths to uncover any materials, but they are opportunistic. And this is a really interesting one because, you know, this is the one where, you know, we have to really question, is this actively cheating uh, in this modern world of work with the internet being a key workplace tool? You know, actually, is this behaviour that we should applaud or recognise as, as positive behaviour rather than consider um, to be cheating as such? We then get to um, malicious cheats, and these are probably the most pro problematic. And, and I would say that, you know, they, we, there are a portion of organisations who, who hopefully don't really experience these sorts of cheats. We, we tend to see them, and the, um, there, are, there are various websites, I don't know if, if all of you would have experienced them, but there are websites out where you can buy the materials for certain organisations' recruitment processes. And those are the individuals who we would term malicious cheats. Now, these cheats most typically target organisations where um, the organisation sponsors work permits because their market most typically is international students who have invested huge amounts in their study in the UK and who are under significant parental prep pressure to make sure they get jobs and, and work permits to stay working here now. Clearly, that's a, a generalisation, but that does tend to be their key target audience. So we do tend to see um, you know, organisations who sponsor work permits as being the, the, the most heavy targets of these malicious cheats. But these individuals are you know, really quite shocking. Um, we have seen individuals actually in assessment centres with their phones out, you know, photocopying materials. Um, they will actively lie they'll take risks through the process they will quite comfortably sit there and hold up fake id um, and and you know use fake ID, uh, names and things because their purpose isn't to try and get a job their purpose is to understand the nature of your recruitment process and to access your assessment materials so that they can then make money out of sharing those materials with others so those are the ones that sort of it takes a different type of defensiveness or um, defense to um to, to inhibit. And then the counterpart to the malicious cheats is, is what we've termed the serious cheats. And the serious cheats are the reasons why malicious cheats have a market. So typically serious cheats are motivated by fear of failure. 
They want to work for you so much that they will go to any lengths to optimize their chances, including paying for access to your materials or getting somebody else to complete aspects of your process for them. You know, ironically, they may well be capable of passing your process on your own, but they just don't want to take any risks. Um, and you know, the reason why they're doing it is not because um, they're, de they're demotivated, but they might have motivated so much to work for you um, that they're actually uh, doing whatever they can to put sort of the buffers down the bowling lane. I think before we, we go any further and talk about what we can do to address these types of cheating, it's probably just worth saying that first of all, I think we do need to slightly reframe cheating. You know, in, in the old world, um, you know, assessment was all about you know, replicating closed booked exams, really. We expected people to have no access to any materials other than the materials in which were presented to them. We would you know, shut them in a room, we get out a stopwatch to manage things at the exact moment. Um, but actually, when we take a step back and think about what effective assessment, you know, the best way to tell if someone can do the job is to get them to do the job. And, and you know, with exceptions of professional qualifications, the very vast majority of working tasks just simply don't look like that these days and don't work that way. You know, you're not in a situation in which your access to the internet is restricted. You are able to use all materials that are available. You, know, you typically don't have a you know a hard and fast um, stop. And actually, usually we say we see the you know, gathering of other people's inputs, collaborating, you know, sharing ideas, getting feedback as a, as a positive workplace behavior. So I think you know, the, the first thing for us to do is to stop and think about whether the things that people are cheating on are really things that um, are appropriate aspects of assessment in the modern era. You know, the internet is a really key workplace tool. We do need to be really realistic about people's access to information. And ultimately, you know, as uh, I think Trisha inferred earlier as well, yeah, as recruiters, we need to make sure that our assessments reflect the working reality um, and that you know, actually we uh, open our eyes to the reality that people will have access to these, um, you know, to other pieces of information and shared materials. We need to design assessments where we're assessing more people, what people do with that information and how they use that information rather than the fact that they have that information to start with. So I think the first thing that we, we should all do is just reframe what we actually mean when we're talking about cheating. And I think from our perspective, we're talking about people who are actively trying to undermine um, your process or actively trying to um, represent themselves as having skills, abilities um, or capabilities that they don't have or plagiarizing content um, and representing somebody else's content as their own. So when we're, um, reframe it in that way, we can then start to think about what we can or should do or can, could consider doing to drive that remote trust, to, tr to drive that ability to truly trust applicants who are coming through our recruitment process and trust that the, you know, their output is authentic and truly their own. I think the first thing it's worth saying is that you know, we tend to say to people, your recruitment process is a funnel. Um, it matters less if people pass through the front end of your process than if they pass through the back end of your process. Ideally, you won't let any so true cheats um, come through your process at all, but the, the, the ultimate aim is to make sure that they don't get the job at the end of it. Um, and therefore, you know, the most focus should be on the final stages where you really do want to make sure that the person who you're speaking to is, of course, the person who they represent. So when you're doing your final stage assessments, making sure that you do have something like your passport verification, making sure that you have multiple different assessments at that final stage so that you're able to you know, reassess the capabilities that have been previously assessed and make sure that they're consistently able to demonstrate those behaviours. And obviously making sure that an aspect of that assessment is in person. All of those things will really help you um, to make sure that you know, whether it's you know, through virtual or in person, you know, the individual who you're offering the job to is who they say they are and that their output um, is their output. Um, there's there's a, lot, a lot that can be done to address particularly those, um, you know, the, the, the naive sharing and the casual cheating through education and deterrent. So you're know, just actually talking to people about the why honesty and integrity is so important to your organization, uh, et cetera, is, is really key. But you can um, you know, make sure that you 
I guess, take it a step further and actually talk about the consequences of bringing people in who've um, demonstrated uh, a lack of, of integrity and, and why that might have, um, you know, why you might therefore have to apply serious um, consequences um, if people are found to be being disingenuous. Um, but then you can go it a little bit of a step further. So, you know, deterrents are things like making sure people can't easily download materials onto their um, their local devices. So particularly in this virtual world, we've got assessment centres, making sure that whatever platform you're using to share that information doesn't save a copy down into the individual's you know, downloads, because that just makes it too easy for them to share and also implies that you don't mind them owning those materials and potentially sharing them. You also can do things like, you know, um, for example, in all of our Amberjack blended assessments, um, the, the webcam light stays on in, even when people are taking the, um, you know, the, the multiple choice based assessments. So we tell them at the front um, that they are being recorded, they are being monitored and that we are looking um, you know, to identify any behaviours that indicate that the individual may either not be who they say they are or that they're using um, you know, preset answers or um, or insights and, and that's a fairly a fairly strong deterrent you know it's unlikely that you're as an organization going to go through all of those videos and watch each individual to make sure that it truly was them but the fact that you could um, does obviously put people off um, from unless they're the the malicious cheats um, they're the only sorts of individuals who are likely to to take those sorts of risks because ultimately the majority of people completing your assessments do want your job and they don't want to take a risk that they might be exited from the process just by making a, a naive mistake like um like cheating in the assessments the other things you can obviously do are monitor response times and high frequency response patterns on any automated assessments um whether high frequency response patterns which aren't entirely correct or when people are completing them in an unrealistic time frame or you can also keep an eye on uh, for logins from multiple um, multiple machines. All of those things are indicators that potentially um, somebody might be um, trying to, to, to play the system. One of the things that um, we're going to be doing over the course of the next period, which I think is quite an interesting one, is, is we're going to be watermarking all assessments with um, the candidate, either the candidate name or the candidate ID. Um, and so if anybody does screenshots or if they do want to sort of share materials, they'll be sharing those materials with their name across it. So obviously any materials that we find, it will be able to be attributed back to that individual. And, and also the main point is it's likely to act as a significant barrier to that individual sharing that as obviously they'll be sharing their personal information um, at the same time. Again, this is an interesting one because serious sheets um, the malicious types are, are unlikely to be um, put off by that either because they'll be comfortable taking the time to sort of type back out um, your materials and, and present them in a different format. So it, it won't be a barrier to them, but it should be a barrier to, to all of the you know, sort of less conscious or less deliberate or less malicious cheating. Also, we, we have for a long time now been recommending the use of, of blended assessments rather than the use of um, automated assessments and then video interviews. Our assessments are blended together so that you're able to see a video of the person at the same time as you're able to see the, the automated response items and obviously checking the IP addresses to make sure it's the same computer that's all the same um, you know, IP address that's been used for the completion of the whole assessment enables you to verify that the person you saw in the video is likely to be the person who started the start, did the assessment even though of course it is possible they could get their mum to come in and sit next to them etc so as i said that the malicious cheats are the ones that are the, the slightly trickier ones to to address um, but also um some of the model answer the insight that's come from sort of casual sharing is reasonably problematic because although you know your your sort of um your casual cheat hasn't deliberately set out to undermine your process you do want to be able to be confident that whatever it is that they're submitting is authentically their contribution so that you can rely on the skills and abilities that um you know, they've demonstrated through completing the assessment so what are the things that that we've built out as a consequence of the sort of partnership with this um client of ours that was experiencing or concerned of um, that they were receiving 20% of their applicants were cheating in the assessment centre. We've introduced a functionality that we refer to as remote trust into um, our virtual assessment centre platform impact. And this tool actually looks at um, 
any written submissions and it checks those written submissions against previous written submissions. So some of you may be aware of proctoring tools that have been used by you know, universities potentially in the past where people have been trying to identify um, cases of potential plagiarism. Those typically compare submissions to libraries of pre-existing information. Um, this tool actually goes a, a sort of a step further because it compares the submissions to all other submissions. So it compares that candidate submission to the submissions that you've received from any other candidates. And it flags those through to the recruiter to be able to look at and to then um, either verify or, or um, yeah, overall um, the flag for, for cheating. And it's done on a real time basis so that um, before you set up those, those offers, you're able to give yourself a level of comfort that um, each of the submissions that you receive from candidates um, was authentic. Um, and so if you do all of those things, if you design assessments that are you know, um, representative of the reality of the modern working world, um, you know, where the internet is a, um, an effective business tool, if you do work hard on the sort of communication and put some um, deterrence and, and monitoring in place um, to, to pick up um, any of the characteristics that might indicate um, dishonest behaviour, uh, you're, you're going to, to go a, a long way. And if you can make sure that you're able to physically see candidates at all stages, it will help you. Um, and then for those of you who, who do have reason to believe that actually you may be um, you know, seeing a significant proportion of you know, undesirable behaviour through the recruitment process, if you are interested in, in finding out a little bit more about um, Ajax Remote Trust Tool, then obviously be, be more than happy to, to share that with information with you. So I think that was all I was, um, was going to cover. I did say, Trish, I thought we'd have a, a decent amount of time for questions. And I don't know, Stephen, if any have come through or if any have been previously submitted. Um, that was great. Thanks a lot, um, uh, Sophie and Tristram. Um, really interesting. Um, uh, well, I said really interesting topic, and really interesting just sort of hearing what um, just how big the issue is and what people are doing to to tackle it. Um, uh, a couple of comments in the chat box. Um, I, I had a couple of questions just to get us going. Actually, so just to remind us, for everybody, if you want to ask some questions um, or just open up a broader discussion, to, please do pop it in the in the chat. Um, I guess one of my a question I had, this isn't quite so much about cheating, but it's more like, because there are websites out there where we know where um, students use chat functions, they don't just talk about assessments, but they actually do, you know, share amongst their community peer to peer details of the assessment process they, 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 they went through. So it's not necessarily cheating, but it does feel um, it's kind of it's it, it's definitely disclosing what you know what 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 some employers might might prefer to sort of stay with the band of assessment. And I've always had um, a bit of a, a mixed view on that, and it partly comes from back in my old role when, of course, we went very much down the strengths route, and there was a danger we felt that candidates became scripted if they knew the answers. Actually, they would then play to a script, which is the one thing we're getting away to. So I don't know. There, have you got any thoughts on 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 that? Maybe Sophie around. Is there a danger actually from just a candidate's point of view if they become over prepared if they write themselves a script and play to it? That might actually, um, you know, be a detriment to their to their application, even though they think they're doing the right thing. No, I completely agree, Stephen, and, and I think yeah, we've all heard this where you've asked them one question and they've answered one that's similar but slightly different because they pre-prepared it, and there's definitely that risk. And I, for me, that's part of the accepting the reality of the working world and designing your assessments around that reality, um, because you know actually. Yeah, you, you don't have to look hard to find some fairly significant insights into each recruitment process, even if it's not the specific questions, it's the type of questions and it's the stages and that's for, for most organisations. Um, so uh, I think you know, Tristan sort of inferred this earlier, designing you know, uh, questions that are much more ad hoc. Um, and assessments where you know, you, the structure of the assessment might be the same, but the content varies the whole time. So people don't know exactly what they're going to face. We've for uh, a number of years now been designing multiple versions of parallel assessments for clients. So they might have three different component parts to their assessment centre, but they might have five versions of each of those, which are all predictively equivalent. But when you put them together, you can obviously then have five to the power of three different iterations of the ways in which they manifest themselves. And sometimes that doesn't have to be really complex. It could just be that the framework of the exercise is the same, but the materials that the exercise refers to is different, or they're exactly the same, but you've changed some key data points. So in one version of it, it you know, infers a positive correlation and another one it infers a negative correlation or something. So just, just making sure that you sort of think about those sorts of things is, is really key. And yeah, part of that is to then 
help students recognize through the communication and the education that that sort of thing does happen and that over preparing actually as you've, you've said there can hinder your chances rather than you know improve the chances and ultimately a lot of that education and this is perhaps the the message that I'm sure universities are already putting out there but at the end of the day the recruitment process there is is there for the student as well as for the organization you know it's, it's not in a student's interest to get a role that they wouldn't be able to get in their own you know inherent merits if they sort of cheat their way into a role or um, they access materials that you know, aren't their own um, then the chances are they're going to find themselves in a role that they're not well suited to that they won't excel at and that they won't enjoy and if we can help them understand that, then hopefully we can take away from some of that pressure around, you know, I must prepare, I've got access to these materials, I should cheat and actually just go in and be their authentic selves. A lot of what we're designing these days from an assessment perspective is much more about individual purpose. Um, so it is really hard to cheat um, because, you know, it, it's very hard to represent somebody else's, you know, authentic views as your own. I think there's something here about the difference between substance and process as well in that I think it's, it's, it's fine for students. If students spend time researching the company and finding out what that company is really looking for and thinking, you know, so one company might be really emphasising, you know, the uh, ability to kind of build networks and be extroverts. Others might be really emphasising technical ability. And, and, and actually for students to find that out, both by talking to employers and by talking to their peers, I think is, is fine. Um, where it gets problematic is where they're not actually looking at the substance they're looking at the process and they're trying to figure out what is the right answer to this question and, and I think as, as Sophie said really ideally good assessment shouldn't shouldn't really you know be open to that kind of uh, uh, cheating really because we, we, we as much as possible we're trying to you know you're trying to design processes which are not just about ticking particular boxes and, and getting through they're actually about us figuring out whether somebody is is of the is the kind of person who you want to work in your firm and ha has that the kind of substance and attributes and abilities that you're looking for so i think there's there's something on both sides but i think if 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 students and and, and you know from careers service point of view if students really focus on process and foxing the process that's probably the wrong wrong place to start really and i, and I think there's a, a difference as well from an assessment point of view between um some of the you know, on behavioral aspects and some of the harder technical pieces because you know there are certain roles where you do require either you know, certain aptitudes or certain cognitive abilities, and you need people to be able to apply those capabilities in a certain capacity. And those sorts of assessments probably are more likely to have wrong and right answers, or certainly you know, be a little bit more fixed in terms of their content, because part of the way in which you ensure there's you know, fairness and consistency in assessments is by having materially similar content. And I think you know, that's the bit where you know, something like the, the remote trust tool that we've brought in as a, a sort of a, a role to play I think because you know we can have you know group exercises or discussions which enable us to assess some of the the behavioral traits and we can have you know dynamic content which you know um, addresses some of these issues of not being able to over prepare but when you are actually trying to assess somebody's computational reasoning ability or whether you're trying to assess their ability to you know ver use various data points in order to arrive at you know um, so certain conclusions so the sorts of things that might sit in in case studies or some of the more written or analytical exercises that might be part of an assessment process I think those are the ones which people are most likely to cheat on because they they're worried about them um, and they're also the ones where um, you know it's probably most critical that you do actually pick up where people aren't able to, to complete those sorts of tasks themselves because if they are a core part of the role and that individual doesn't have those you know the capability that it is going to be rather rather challenging for them so I think you know this combination of giving students the sort of the confidence to focus on finding out more about the sort of the cultural dynamics and those um, you know, the, those wider aspects that you were just referring to, to Tristram, and then also getting them to realize then that, you know, they actually, there's a benefit to them of, um, of being off their authentic selves as well. And then I think at the end of the day, there, there will be a percentage who will still go through these processes. And as much as we might all like to think it doesn't happen, they will be trying to, 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 to cheat. And if it really matters to your organisation, then put in place some of the checks and balances, do the monitoring, look at the data. Um, and, and yeah. yeah, and I think some, 
students just don't realize how important it is because you know the the stories we hear where a student you know they missed a degree classification by sort of you know one or two percentage points and and said well I was close enough anyway and I should have had it it was x reason I think sometimes they don't equate because you know employers will tell us that you know that is evidence because actually what they will say is that well if you're in a similar situation at work let's say you're in a regulated business and a client is putting you under pressure to bend the rules well actually there's evidence that somebody will i mean there is evidence in this it's not a benign thing in a way and i sometimes get a bit annoyed with the apprentice kind of um program view of it which is all you know it's all a bit of a blag and it's all a bit everybody flannels their cv a bit and there's a bit of difference between i guess maybe slightly flowery language and actually telling a barefaced lie because the employers i know if you've lied on your cv that means you're going to lie in work and we can't take that take that 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 risk i think the more students kind of get that message of the seriousness of it it might have made, made them think twice yeah it's an error of judgment isn't it and when you've seen evidence of an error of judgment you can't be sure you won't see it again and i think you know that most employers and i'd like to say all but it's probably not quite all but most will have mitigating circumstances considerations and there are appropriate processes for you to go through if you haven't quite you know, got a story to tell um, but that's maybe on employers as well these days there's, there's no reason why um, if you have increasingly automating your process you haven't got the capacity to engage in dialogue and I think we're in a world now where actually 80% of applicants should be able to move through recruitment processes with very lit little or limited recruitment and in recruiter intervention, which then frees the recruiters up to invest the time in those 20%, those people who've missed a grade by something or don't, you have some particular context or an additional need that they need an adjustment for, that's where all the recruiter efforts should go. And I think probably, um, you know, with the exception of those organisations that outsource some of their recruitment, where they typically do look at having those services that um, provide that level of support, most organisations are a little bit scared about opening up a proper hotline, having a proper chat with students because they think they're going to be overwhelmed. Um, but actually, you know, if, if we do those sorts of things most of, more effectively, then hopefully we will also stop students from feeling the need to just fudge a number because they don't think they'll get through a process. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I do remember one case where the person fudged it and actually they didn't need to. They still would have had the job offer, but because they'd fudged it, it was, yeah, it was, um, the offer was 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 withdrawn. Um, yeah. Tristan, from, um, I guess, a sort of, a, a, I don't know if you're um, close to this on campus and academic point of view, because this is a very live debate on campus, isn't it, with things like essay mills, um, you know, people paying people to write their, their essays and assessments for them. Are there some parallels between that conversation and, and this conversation? Is it all part of, you know, the, 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 same, the same problem and maybe a shift in student mentality, do you think? Um, yeah, I'm always a bit, a bit, I mean, it's, it's not, maybe not a shift in mentality, but it probably is a shift in opportunity, isn't it? Is that some things have become possible that like, you know, when I was doing my degree in the, you know, 1800s, it was, it was, would have been very difficult for me to find somebody to write my essays for me. I would have had to, you know, wander around the university looking at older students and trying to get them to, to, to do it, you know. Whereas now it's very easy, it's affordable and so on. And, and the same is true with this. I mean, I don't, Sophie's probably looked more into how the mechanisms of the, of the kind of, um, you know, professional cheaters work. But you, if you want to get an essay written, you know, there's a, there's, there are tools that allow you to do that and which are, you know, within the means and, and uh, kind of, ideas of students so this I suppose the first thing is, is you put you put temptation in people's way don't you and the second thing is is there anything that the institutions can do to try and manage this and you know the universities are struggling with that but they they have essentially built a, a number of tools which which at least catch some of that so particularly you know they've got the the um, turn it in tool that essentially runs everything through and that's come out of a collaboration from different universities that says, um, you know, we can look at everybody's essays together and see if they're plagiarizing substantial amounts. And, you know, so I think some of it can be solved by technology. Some of it can be, has to be solved by trying to address what students are, how they're thinking and, and being clear about what is and is outside of the rules and what the consequences are if you get caught and so on. And I suppose one of the things that was a bit disappointed in from the survey that we did was the fact that the university's engagement in managing cheating as a problem at this stage was so much lower than employers and you would you know it, it obviously there's a limit to what universities are going to be able to do here but but you would have thought that it would be something that career service would be focused on and would be trying to 
kind of addressed, both from the point of view of it's the right thing to do, but also from the point of view of if students do it and they get caught, it's risky for them and not a good idea. And it kind of, as, as we've been talking about, it kind of misunderstands what the whole recruitment process is really supposed to be trying to achieve. So I think there's, you know, given that universities have put so much energy into trying to fight the essay mills, you would have thought that there's probably a bit of scope for them to do a bit more to contribute to the kind of early career piece as well. And, and, and as you were saying all that, Trisha, another thing which is going through my head, which I think is quite an interesting one, it was a sort of point that was um, made to me by, by one of our clients, which is a certain amount of, you want there to be effort done to prevent people who aren't really cheats it's the the opportunists rather than the the sort of the cheats but there is something about this being actually a true opportunity to identify people who don't have the levels of integrity that you need particularly if you're a regulated business etc because if you talk to, if you try to assess against values it's very very hard because you know people like intrinsically will of course say of course integrity is very important to me I always act with integrity um, but this is a, an actual opportunity for organizations to identify those individuals who may not have integrity so if we are all communicating if we are all letting people understand the consequences of you know um any disingenuous behavior through the recruitment process or the submission of plagiarized content and people are still plagiarizing content and or you know cheating their way through the process actually to some extent we want to be able to identify those individuals so that we make sure that we don't give them offers um and it, it's it's an interesting one because you automatically think you want to stop the cheating in some respects you want the cheats to behave as cheats so you can make sure that you don't hire the cheats um so long as you can properly identify them I think that's why your typology is so helpful, actually, is that, that it gives us, you know, if you think of those two bottom categories, you know, the people who are doing it kind of accidentally just out of a sense of being a good member of the community. Um, and, and that is something that you can deal with by education, isn't it? And, and saying, well, look, actually, you know, that's not really. And I mean, also on both sides of that, you know, f- to some extent to students saying, well, that's not really on and that is cheating. And for employers saying basically, you know, don't design processes that are so easy for, for to be foxed. But and then the opportunistic ones, you can up the threshold with some of the things that you were talking about, like the, you know, keeping the webcam light on and 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 take out a lot of the opportunistic ones. And that means that that a lot of the more advanced technical strategies are really trying to identify these people who are actually, you know, are doing it deliberately, who are doing it with with malice. And, and, you know, which then try, and then I think they, they can be treated, you know, much more seriously and, and, and you know, more, more punitively, really, if you can figure it out, you can kick them out of the process in a way that, um, you know, it's probably, you probably don't want to be doing to people who are just taking a bit of a shortcut or, or who are trying to behave well, you know, you probably don't want to be weeding all of those people out of your process. You want to be trying to kind of educate them and prevent them from getting in, getting kind of sucked into it. I think you're exactly right. And I think funny enough, at the moment, I think some of that happens where people do identify cheating. They're often taking out people who probably don't have a lack of integrity. They probably made a stupid error. They're probably being opportunistic. They were probably being naive. Um, so I think, you know, that point you made about pushing as hard as you can on the education and deterrence across the board, universities through to employers all the way through, don't do this. If you do this, these are the consequences. This is why it matters. Watermarks and things to flag and remind you, don't do this. But then monitor and do pick up, you know, monitor those behaviours on any of the you know, automated tests. Use a remote trust tool to pick up anybody who's submitting plagiarised or similar content to others, because those are the ones you definitely don't want to have in your organisation. So I don't think it's an either or. And I do think it's probably an issue that most you know, all employers should be looking at. Most probably do have their head in the sand on. And I certainly know that we probably did to an extent before we were encouraged to, to look at this as heavily as we, as we have done recently. Um, Sophie, is there also um, sort of a bit of a cost benefit analysis on this? Because I suppose if you were really worried about it, the at the extreme the robustness, you know, you would have somebody going around and sitting in person while somebody does something online, or you get every single person very with the process in the office, which of course is un- unrealistic. So I guess some of this is getting the balance right and the right level of investment. Um, yeah. 
but then also not ignoring right. it because you've got two extremes. Yeah, I think you're yeah. right. And I think this is a little bit what I was talking about with the funnel. Because I think at the front end, I think you, what you do then is put some sensible checks and balances in. You put the deterrents in. You know, you, you do some mon data monitoring so that you can pick up anomalies and in patterns. But investing too much time and effort at that stage is clearly, you know, it's not you know, cost efficient or effective or proportionate to the risk. But actually, at that back end, when it really matters, when you, you know you're at making the decisions to in or out with individuals you know I, I think the more you can put in at that stage the better because we all know you know it depends which data source you look at but even with graduate hires you're talking tens of thousands in the you know the cost of making the wrong hire whether that is because you're bringing somebody in with a lack of integrity who, um, or whether it's because you're bringing somebody in who just can't do the role and you've got to exit and the ones with a lack of integrity you know arguably could be costing you, you know, millions of pounds if, if you actually get into situations in which they're making you know um, poor values judgments in the workplace. Yeah, agreed. Um, fantastic. I think that's um, everything we intended to, to to cover there. We're getting close towards towards the hour, so and um, that was a really great session. Thanks, um, thanks very much. I think this is um, a subject that we need to keep returning to actually, because I think there is a danger that we just ignore it and, and bury our heads in the sand, and it it does have a direct impact. As I said, you know. If, if people from a student point of view, if you end up in the wrong job, um, if you've been successfully teaching, actually that's still not a good outcome because you're probably in the wrong pace if you had to had to blag, blag your way in there. Um, so if you, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you if they just want to sort of explore this issue with you a, a little bit more? Um, from a, if they want to get in touch with me personally, very welcome to get in touch through LinkedIn or I'm sophie.meany at weareamberjack.com. Generally, if you want to get in touch with Amberjack, hello at weareamberjack.com um, is there on the screen as well. So very happy to connect in person or to, to put you in touch with colleagues if you'd like to find out more. Fantastic. And, um, and Tristram, are you doing a, a blog piece on this? Is there is it is there something on the Knowledge Hub going on about this? Has it gone on already? Yeah, we put we put one up um, last week, uh, and, but I think there might be a bit more scope to do a bit more on this so we'll we'll have a bit of a think and see whether we could do do a bit more and because there's the the report will be going up today uh, after this session so if you want to actually get get and have a look at some of the data that i was talking through plus a couple of other things that we we surveyed people on during august then have a look at that report but yeah i'm sure we'll do a bit more on the on the blog about this Fantastic. So that's the Knowledge Hub on the IC website. Um, um, please go and have a look at that. And then also um, you've got the slide up on your screens, which is getting in touch with, with Amberjack. So thanks, Sophie. Thanks for um, collaborating with um, with us with on this. And, and thanks for your inputs into it as well, Tristram. That was a, a really good session. Like I said, I'm sure we will come back to this. Sophie, we're going to be online again this afternoon, aren't we, at four o'clock? It's the ISE mm -hmm. Awards session. So so we'll see you again. I'm going to put a shirt and tie on for that one, because I think, you know, we can't quite go black tie, but we should smarten up a little bit. So. Um, um, so, yeah, so um, hopefully see um, those of you online at the awards this afternoon. If you haven't um, clicked um, online to register, you still can do. Go to the website. Um, it's free to attend our awards. So it would be great to see you there. We've just got a, it's only going to be a 45, 50 minute, um, minute, minute session. So um, good to celebrate everything um, great in our industry out there. So fantastic. Thanks very much. Um, as I said at the start, um, this session has been recorded. So um, um, you will get a recording of the session so you can go back and revisit what we covered, but also share it amongst your, your, your teams and share the knowledge. That would be great. Um, have a good day, everybody. Talk to you all soon. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Trisham. Bye.